ambition. So we were looking, you know, so the realistic um, outcomes were uh, not, uh, you know, the the best for science, but uh, the the ray of hope that came um, and ultimately proved to be the case was that a deal would be made because the G20, which was also facing very um, protracted and difficult negotiations, did secure an outcome for the summit um, in the middle of our conference. So that um, also gave a signal that um, it would work out. If I may turn quickly to the, a little bit more detail on the negotiating dynamics. <coughs> if we could go to the next slide. The Deputy Minister mentioned that the summit um, provided much needed momentum and political direction, um, captured the international community's attention and focused, it, you know, focused the negotiations. Uh, and it attracted a, an absolutely massive attendance, bigger than even the General Assembly in New York. I think we got up to about 105 leaders uh, last count. Uh, the two who weren't there in the actual summit but it came individually later were President Biden of the United States and the incoming uh, future president of Brazil, um, Lula da Silva. And they attracted, they held their own meetings with absolutely massive attendance, uh, which also gave some signals to the process. The, the good news on the Russia-Ukraine um, tensions is that it did not really affect these negotiations as much as some of those before us. And that seems to have been because of um, understandings reached between the protagonists um, brokered by Egypt, that they, they were here to land a deal on climate change, which is a global problem. And that would, uh, this, this geopolitical issue would be less prominent. Of course, there were a lot of speeches and uh, positions, but no, and, and there was no blocking action from either side. Um, it was quite, the Russia's positioning was quite interesting. Um, they used to be a member of what was called the Umbrella Group, which is the United States, uh, all the countries who pulled out of the Kyoto Protocol. So Norway, United States, New Zealand, Australia, Israel, and so forth. Um, Russia was expelled from that group um, before the COP by the other members. And, in, and it started to take positions which sounded a lot more like our position, you know, as emerging countries or so-called middle-income countries or developing countries. Um, but it remained, uh, you know, on its own as an individual actor, not part of a group. Uh, I mentioned before that the interesting dynamic here was that China and the United States, despite the public positions before the climate COP, ultimately did reach an understanding. There were private meetings between their delegations, like in all the previous COPs. Um, this time they didn't issue a joint statement with joint positions to frame their final outcome like they did in previous COPs, but they had some sort of understanding between them of the limits uh, or, you know, that, would, that this particular conference would go in. And that um, you know, really influenced the groupings who, you know, who are closely associated with them or like-minded to them. Um, one of them, one, I think this really shaped the final outcomes on fossil fuels and coal in particular, that the US and China would not go further than what was in Glasgow, um, despite the call from some of the Europeans, and that was the final outcome. The Africa group um, at ministerial level and at officials level was quite, um, was fairly united and very well capacitated. So that um, in this particular multilateral process gives us um, quite an advantage that we have such a big structure with so many key experts. Um, of course, Africa is very diverse and there's a lot of overlapping um, negotiating groups here. I've mentioned some of them on the screen, the, the least developed countries, SIDS, Rainforest uh, um, coalitions and uh, co new coalitions of so-called most vulnerable countries. So these all have slightly, and in some cases, very different positions from the Africa group. So that does have a, a push and pull factor on Africa, making it quite difficult to converge the group. But given that context, it was still um, quite coherent. The larger G77 in China tends to be most effective when it, it speaks to big picture political issues, um, such as when we were negotiating the Paris Agreement. 
that these are the issues which unite all developing countries, like the need for support. The more you get into technical, specific negotiation items, which this particular COP was more about, the more difficult it gets to get that convergence because you're dealing with um, economic development issues and the G77 covers a vast range and spectrum of development from China with the one side to the very smallest um, countries on the other side. So um, you would not expect the G77 to have a lot of common positions, but so we were um, very pleased to see that through a very strong chair from Pakistan, which have got a lot of um, you know, uh, diplomatic uh, resources, they did, the group did converge um, on a few key points at the right points in this conference to help all developing countries. <clears throat> the last one I want to mention in the negotiating dynamics was our basic group, which is Brazil, South Africa, India, China. South Africa took over the chair of that, had that ministerial meeting and issued a, a joint communique uh, through the, the media to help influence the negotiations. And this group becomes really important in the dying phases of these conferences where um, there's a tendency uh, from the major powers to try and limit the field of you know, who has a say in the outcomes. Uh, so for developing countries, you know, it's important that you have um, some of us you know, at the table. We want everybody at this table. We want a genuine negotiated text, but the reality sometimes is quite different. So the, the basic group cohering on a few fundamental points um, did help shape these negotiations. If I could move on to the next slide. When we get into the specific negotiation issues, um, a big problem we had was just trying to get um, some countries, especially developed countries, to engage in the negotiations. Um, they were very focused on their priority, which is mitigation and fossil fuels in some cases, not all of them, um, but the issues of importance to Africa and to many developing countries are the finance means of implementation, support, adaptation, loss and damage. And you saw varying degrees of willingness to engage in those conversations, especially adaptation as Africa's big priority issue. Um, you couldn't get anybody to engage for the longest time. Throughout the year, all these workshops, even meetings right up to the end, it wasn't even really a proper negotiation. It was just South Africa in particular, the Africa group, and the leader of the, you know, and the Egyptian uh, coordinator um, leading the thought development on this, putting the text out there. And we did get massive and we thought um, consensus support for that. Um, but the other side, it turns out, was not really willing to engage. There was quite a negative kind of strategy at some point from some countries um, where you got, the, I don't know if it's a perception, or not, but you got um, this uh, view that you know shaping the media narrative and setting you know the other sides up from uh, for blame was more important than negotiating in some cases. This was you know could have applied to countries across all sorts of geographic divides, but it made the negotiations quite uh, difficult. And in particular, the uh, because of the, after Glasgow, you saw announcements on coal, you actually saw a big move back to, from developed countries to use more coal. And there was a, a you know, heightened use of fossil fuels because of uh, factors such as the Ukraine war. And that um, put some countries on a bit of a back foot or defensive. And um, the approach was then to sort of, um, project themselves as the guardians and uh, defenders of the 1.5 degrees. So the, the, the media narrative became all about keeping 1.5 degrees alive. But actually there was nobody in, uh, we saw in any country, any region who was actually looking to replace the 1.5 degrees. It has, it has that uh, support still, but it was more of a, I guess, a tactic. And uh, you would have heard uh, in the announcements made in, in the plenary, for example, from the EU, that they directly proposed what they call a grand bargain, that um, if the so-called the develop, so developing countries would do more in mitigation and deliver um, commitments on fossil fuels in the cover text, because that's not uh, somewhere part of our negotiations, 
um, there, there could be a fund for loss and damage. So that was presented as a kind of a deal, but developing countries didn't see it that way. And this is where the G77 converged very well to help uh, us collectively, um, because we said we need it all. We absolutely want the ambition for mitigation, but we, we, we're not going to leave here without the fund either. Um, so that changed the dynamics and um, I think served us very well. Um, the one thing to note about this process is that it, it, it is a consensus, but there's degrees of consensus. So if you're looking at specific text on very technical issues, which is negotiated, it could be that every line has been properly negotiated. But when you get to these cover texts, which are more the prerogative of the host country um, and 